Uh, firstly, uh, honorable audience, uh, dear friends, uh, firstly, after the professor uh, Ivanov <laughs> lesson, uh, can uh, you last uh, through another? Is a difficult, uh, <laughs> is a difficult answer. Um, over the past, over uh, the past two years, I um, have been thinking a lot about uh, why the world uh, has moved so easily from um, the great uh, peaceful enlargement of the space of freedom and democracy in uh, 1989-90 to the temptation uh, towards authoritarian uh, regime that quickly led to the re-emerge of the second global Cold War, to two regional wars that daily produce death, injury, and destruction, with the potential to turn into World War III. It has been... Um, a span of three decades that signifies not only the emergence of a new generation, but also the demise of another generation. The generation um, that was born during uh, World War II and uh, grew up in the first uh, global Cold War under the threat of nuclear cataclysm. We uh, realize the value of peace, as well as uh, the value of health, only when we have lost them. Just uh, as for young people, death is something that mostly happens to others. Hence, uh, for my presentation of the scientific research project, Peace uh, as a Moral Value from Cultural Diplomacy, to the culture of peace uh, through education. With the Institute for Advanced Study in uh, Levant, Culture and Civilization had launched in partnership with the Berlin Academy for Cultural Diplomacy. Professor Ivanov, uh, uh, speaking before me, uh, presented uh, an excellent uh, lesson on the history of the concept of uh, democracy. I uh, have chosen, before defining concept, to give my personal testimony of a history lived. I also consider this is my duty towards the generation of whom most are, unfortunately, no longer among us. My testimony is that of a child who was born uh, 85 years ago, in 1939, the same year World War II began, in a city or a border that became the front line between Nazi Germany and Communist Russia, two criminal dictatorship and former allies before that fought each other for global supremacy. My parents, alongside myself, twice uh, fled from the Soviet Red Army, losing all our possessions. My grandparents' house was destroyed by bombing raids by the American Air Force. For 13 years, I grew up under the Russian military occupation, which was marked by all the horrors of war. I live uh, through the post-war uh, famine, then through repression under communist dictatorship that followed a right-wing military dictatorship. Members of my family were arrested on political grounds. In 1989, my son and my students participated in the Pusefield uprising in the University Square in Bucharest on December 21st, 19. On that day and during the night that followed, the army and the Securitate killed around 100 young people on the orders of the dictator Ceausescu, while 3,000 others 
were feared, arrested and tortured, were risked by the hundreds of thousands of citizens of Bucharest who surrounded the tanks and then the dictator's palace causing him to flee. If my son, my son who was at the barricade, was saved at the last possible second, unfortunately among those killed were the son of one of my faculty colleagues as well as some of our young neighbors of the block on flat in which we lived. My daughter will finish her final year of high school with a flower vase on the desk where her classmate who was shot, shot in university school would have sat. After the removal of dictators, power in Romania was saved by the other communist leaders following the mediatic diversion in which under the pretext of fighting alleged terrorists, more than 3,000 people lost their lives. 35 years later, those who organized the diversion are still on trial for what the Hague Tribunal has unequivocally classified as crimes against humanity. Elected by the student and professor of the University of Bucharest to its new leadership, in the first months after the revolution, I opened the university balcony to act as a speaking platform for the participants of the longest peaceful demonstration for democracy, which will go on to become a model for civil society in both Eastern and Western Europe, as well as for other countries in Asia and Africa. This peaceful demonstration was brutally repressed by the new regime, a repression which has also been the subject of the lawsuit following another ruling by the International Criminal Court in The Hague, who has also considered this separate act to be a crime against humanity that cannot be subject to any statute of limitations. I have uh, recounting all the above in order to highlight the difficulty of reconciliation between victims and their oppressors. A reconciliation which I achieved during my term on office as president of Romania, a time during which there was no repression, threat, or pressure of any sort. This was a merit of the former political prisoners that had long served in communist prisons, the merit of the former deportees and of those who were wrongfully disposed of uh, all their possession, who did not seek revenge and retribution. During just four years of transition to democracy, we managed to overcome inter-ethnic and inter-religious conflict, to forestall the threat of civil war and to prevent the resumption of centuries old conflicts with our neighbors with whom our relation has remained stable for two and a half decades. This is all to credit of the Romanian people who have paid a heavy social price from the radical economic reforms that were necessary. All this has been possible because in Romania, as in the other countries of Eastern Europe, Political leaders coming from the academic milieu have succeeded in convincing their free-minded electorates that regional peace, seen as a condition for Euro-Atlantic integration, was ultimately more important than the resumption of conflict that had uh, been frozen but never resolved under a communist dictatorship. There was, in effect, a consensus to consider memory itself as a form of justice. Romania was perhaps a special case, but not an isolated one. In all the former communist countries of Central and Eastern Europe, 
those former communist dictators who accepted the peaceful transfer of political power were not tried and convicted for their crimes. However, memory as a form of justice does not also imply forgetfulness or oblivion. And uh, it is the duty of those who study recent history to better introduce today younger generation to this unique moment in the world history, which saw the peaceful transfer of power and transition from a repressive autocratic regime to democracy, alongside the peaceful resolutions of uh, national, ethnic, and religious conflict that had been the subject of bloody wars for two millennia in a region from which two world wars also erupted during the 20th century. This is an example of the transformation of a pedagogy of suffering into a pedagogy of reconciliation offered by the victims themselves to their former oppressor, which can underpin a new concept of peace as a moral value. This historical reconciliation can also be a model of a practice that has transversed all the steps for empathy through trust and towards the assumption of a higher purpose. This model can be useful to today's young generation who are facing current challenges to which no answer is forthcoming. Professor Ivanic and Professor Ivanov shared from their experience in managing the post-communist transition, especially in Balkans. For reconciliation after wars and conflicts to be possible, the leader of society need to be able to find new ways of looking at situations that are seen as dead ends and outline a new language by which to persuade. We now have the opportunity to launch a project dedicated to a promotion of a culture of peace in which researchers in the humanities, scholars, theologians, writers, artists, architects, and musicians are all invited to participate. A culture of peace that is capable of building a space of knowledge and understanding through cooperation and mutual respect. 35 years ago, during the extraordinary expansion of the space of democracy worldwide, we thought uh, that this would be the way to ensure a stable global peace. We now know that democracy itself is just an improbable and perishable instrument. A stable peace can only be ensured by drawing upon the moral values of humanism, liberty, justice, and truth. In a second half of the 20th century, our postmodern society promoted equal rights and racial and ethnic freedoms, equal rights and opportunities for women, respect for those who want to be different. These were, in truth, impressive at Badmas. But they also had the, the side effect of dividing society, even risking this atomization. Finding a perennial common ideal that goes beyond a conjectural solidarity against something is a difficult goal. Peace could be one such ideal. However, this is not a peace imposed under the pressure of fear, but a peace that springs from the deepest conscience of billions of people. 65 years ago, the Russell Einstein Manifesto, written in the midst of the Cold War, pleaded against nuclear threats 
asking us to remember our humanity and forget the rest. Back then, the rest was primarily about the clash of ideologies between dictatorship and democracy. Today, remembering our humanity means building a universal consensus around those moral values that protect the humanity and every person and the dignity of every community. Recently, some American university gave society two dangerous slogans, no culture, no history. Why do you need culture? Why do you need history? Because what the millennial philosophical literature and artistic treasure of humanity can bring to this spiritual revolution in, is a profound knowledge of the human being grounding for millennia in the struggle between the tendency to use power to oppress others for one's own benefit and the aspiration to love one's neighbors. We can transform this vast pedagogy of suffering into a pedagogy of reconciliation. The success of such an endeavor depends first and foremost on our ability to resist those ideologies that generate conflict, our capacity to deal with people's uncertainties and fears, with moments of crisis and outbreaks of, of new violence and terror. Peace must become a truly collective good, rejecting hierarchies and di discrimination, while ideologies new or old must definitively reject intolerance, exclusivism, revenge, retribution, and all other forms of extremism. Wars are not a solution. In truth, my view is that all wars must be defined as a crime against humanity. Even if they come to an end, the suffering and resentment of the former belligerents remain just as vivid in the collective memory and have an impact on the future. In my opinion, a culture of peace is more than anti-cultural dialogue and its construction requires more time and perseverance. It is a process of continuous education from childhood to old age. One cannot ignore the fact that the culture of peace cannot be separated from a new culture of democracy and even from a new culture of market economy. In the second half of the second millennium, and in the first part of the third, technological progress and affluence have created a paradox before our very eyes, the debauchery of consumption. Against the backdrop of fragile world peace, wars between large group of states have been replaced by a plethora of civil, ethnic, racial, and religious wars, which are highly profitable for arms manufacturers or terrorist action by anonymous group of people who extol the religion of violence. Violence begets violence, and the psychology of fear through manipulation becomes a political weapon in today's world. Visionary leaders are being replaced by managers seeking quick profits that act under the tyranny of the vote. From a shield against dictatorship, human rights in our democracy of freedom without responsibility have become a religion from which human duties are removed. In turn, charity itself is transformed into a lucrative business for commercials and for advertising agencies. Visual technology offers non-stop entertainment, eliminating time for reflection and any effort for thought. Internet communication amounts to a conversation about nothing. All in all, in the modern world, suffering itself becomes a spectacle in which uh, 
filming the dying is more urgent than saving them. Is this transformation of patterns of progress, technology, culture, and civilization into act of aggression against the human soul and inevitability? Can recourse to moral values be a way of salvation? We are fortunate to live in a relatively the same world of the 21st century, thanks to international law and technological progress. However, we won't truly be able to talk to one another until we are also living in the same time. However, in order to be present in the moment towards each other, to highlight our particularities and affinities, we need to build a universal consensus around those moral values that protect the humanity of each person and the dignity of each community. It is a risky proposition to build such a consensus around the idea of the good. We can suspect that for centuries to come, each society will have its own conception of its uh, earthly or spiritual well-being. To attempt to standardize this disparate concept is, is to advocate the establishment of a single way of thinking and to multiply sources of tension in vain. Political doctrines, symbolic context, local transition, and belief system are irreducible. They are therefore legitimate suspicious about any syncretist project capable of uh, relativizing the uniquenesses of these discourses and representation. No one, be they a politician, thinker, religious leader, ordinary person, is willing to sacrifice his or her identity for an ecumenism that would erase all differences. We cannot effectively engage in dialogue if our interlocutor perceives himself as being in danger of mutilation, his own identity. Moreover, nothing authorizes us to claim that the offer we present is superior in the absolute to any offers made by others. On the other hand, no one today can claim to reduce the human family as a whole to the common denominator of one's own political, economic, cultural, or religious choices. That is why it seems more reasonable to me to identify first and foremost the evil that we must fight against together. It is in uh, the interest of all nations to come together to reject what they find intolerable. I am fully convinced that all of us here today reject out of hand war, terrorism, torture, pollution, hate speech, xenophobia, racism, and genetic manipulation, exploitation of minors, social exclusion, hunger, discrimination in employment, on the grounds of gender, religion, or ethnicity. We have a duty to diagnose these pathologies together, just as we can heal together the wounds they continue to cause. I can say from experience um, that the head of state is a must of time focused on matters of state reform and budgets uh, with little time left uh, to think directly about people. And this is a particularly sad reality because no state exists without its people. We strive uh, for people to get a good education, and they do. They become doctors, professors, engineers, uh, uh, teachers, scientists, lawyers, uh, judges, soldiers, writers, musicians, and brilliant artists. But it's enough. It is enough. Should we not be concerned to provide an education of value and principle alongside an education of knowledge? For some time now, 
international organizations such uh, as the United Nations, UNESCO, and civil society have been trying to create a political culture of security through negotiation and cooperation. In order to promote peace and understanding in the world, they are looking for the lowest common denominator around which can, uh, can agree. This is a right and welcome approach, especially in order to counter immediate threats. My conviction is that we must aim much higher. If we want to achieve true peace, understanding between people, we must focus not on the lowest common denominator, but on the highest common denominator, which to me is our face. 35 years ago, in Eastern Europe, millions of people, empty-handed, were ready to fight and die for their faith in the ideals of freedom and democracy, bringing down the greatest war machine in human history. Now, in the new millennium, we can rediscover this faith. And we can rediscover in not in order to deploy it, as has been the case throughout the long human history against one another, but in order to come together and better understand our shared destiny on Earth. The question then is, where do each of us begin this inner journey that focuses our attention on love and not hatred, on understanding and not division? Where do we begin the spiritual orientation that can bind together the difficult fragments of our lives, transforming us into beings that uh, are at peace with ourselves? The answer is, we need to start from where we are. Each of us is called to understand the meaning of our lives and to understand above all the place we give to faith in our souls. Because in the end, lasting, enduring change is always only that which starts from within each of us. Thank you.